1 Timothy chapter 4, down to the bottom of the chapter, we're going to read verses 13 through 16 today. When I was in Bible college, they always told us that every scripture has a primary interpretation. And then there's many practical applications that you can make from that scripture. And today we're going to look at more of a practical application from this scripture. I'll share with you what the primary interpretation is, what Paul was telling young Timothy here, the reason behind it and the reason behind these words. And so we'll look at that. But that's not what I want to focus on. Um, the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus are what we call pastoral epistles because they're letters that Paul wrote to two particular men, Timothy and Titus. And these young men were what we would call today preacher boys. These were young men that Paul was training to be preachers. And, and so a lot of the words that are in there for, are for them to help them as, as a pastor, as a preacher, as they minister to people. And a lot of times I hesitate to say that because you think, well, what's the purpose in me as a person reading First and Second Timothy and Titus if those words are for a preacher? And that's because there are many applications of what is being said here that will help us in our daily walk and in our daily life as well. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to take a, a, a apply what Paul told Timothy to our lives as Christians and how it can help us, okay? And so the, let's go ahead and read this first. In, we're not going to read, like I said, all the chapters. We're going to read those last few verses there. But I'll tell you what was going on and why Paul wrote those words to Timothy. And then we're going to take a look at how that we can apply it to ourselves. And again, this goes along with our theme of messages uh, of continuing. How that you and I need to continue in the faith in this day and age that we live. You know, and, and I know a lot of people, they look at the future and they see how bad things are right now and with inflation and high gas prices and all that stuff. But my friends, really we have, as believers in Christ, if you continue with all these things that we've been talking about, you really have nothing to worry about. We, we know that our life is in God's hands, okay? And that he'll take care of everything. He truly will. And so we really don't have anything as believers in Christ to worry about. We truly don't. I'm not saying things aren't going to get bad, but I do know that my God is greater than anything that can happen in this world. And he can provide and take care of us. He always has, and he always will. And so that's why we've been looking at these messages on continuing in this day and age that we live. All right, let's go ahead and look at these words here again. This picture in your mind, an older preacher, Paul, talking to this young preacher boy. And they say that Timothy was actually pretty young. Uh, this young preacher boy. And these are the last words of this chapter that he shares with him. And he tells Timothy, he says, listen, he says, till I come, he says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And then he says, continue in them. And there's our word. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So why does Paul tell Timothy these words? Okay, picture if you will. Let's use Barrett's Chapel as an example, as a for example. <clears throat> I've been here for a lot of years, you know, and thankful that God has allowed me to stand in this pulpit and preach for all these years. But picture in your mind someday that I retire, okay? It's probably 10 years from now, but anyway, picture in your mind someday I retired. So we bring a new fellow in, all right? You go to a church where a pastor's been there for a lot of years, it's always difficult for this new man to come in. You know, it's like, well, that's not the way Pastor Brian did it. That's not the way we used to do it, you know, and things are difficult. Now, Paul was at Ephesus for, and I did a lot of research on this, for at least two and a half years, as much as three and a half years, okay? It depends on what commentary you read and, and how you interpret different things and stuff. But point is, is Paul had been at Ephesus for a long time, two to three years. He'd been there and he basically started the church that was there at Ephesus, okay? And if you know anything about the history of Ephesus, Paul, he was pretty radical in his preaching and his teaching. And he almost started a riot one day at the temple. And so it's kind of those things that had happened. But people were adamant followers of what Paul was doing there at Ephesus. And so then when Paul leaves, Paul and his company of people that were with him, he leave to go to another city to start another church. He left Timothy in charge of the church at Ephesus. Okay. That's what he had done. And so here's Timothy. And as again, he's a young man. He's not very old at all. He's new in the faith as it is. And if you know Timothy's story, he's not 
100% Jew. And so there were those at the church in Ephesus, the leaders, the, the deacons is what we would call them, okay, that were there at the church that were giving Timothy a hard time. And so that's why he tells Timothy these words, okay? And he's trying to encourage Timothy to continue in these things and, and, and to continue to do what needs to be done. You know, God has given you this ministry. This was by prophecy that you should be a preacher. Don't let them intimidate you. You continue to do what you know you're supposed to do. And so that's why he was telling young Timothy to continue in these things. And so my message today is centered around verse 16. Look again, if you will, in verse 16 there. He says, take, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save yourself and them that hear thee. And when I first started to prepare this message, actually several weeks ago, <clears throat> I had every intentions of preaching the message and titling this message, Continue in the Doctrine. If you look up on the wall, that's not what I entitled to the message today, okay? Because as this week progressed and as I read and I studied, something caught my attention. You know, the Lord wanted me to see this, obviously. But look at that again. <clears throat> verse 16, first of all, in verse 16, Paul tells Timothy, Take heed unto thyself, unto yourself, and unto the doctrine. And he says, continue in them. That word them is plural. And so not just the doctrine, but yourself. And so I got to thinking about that. What does he mean by that? Continue in yourself. Take heed unto yourself and continue in that. And this is where we start to make an application for you and I. We have, um, I don't know what the right word I want to say, but we have a need in our life to take care of ourselves spiritually. Okay, certainly we take care of ourselves physically, personally, and all that kind of thing. You know, we get up in the morning, personal hygiene, we take a shower, we get all clean and pretty and stuff like that. We feed ourselves, we, you know, we do all those things. We have, but do we take care of our spiritual health as well? And I think that's the application that Paul was trying to give Timothy. And it's an application that we need to make to ourselves is that we need to continue in our devotion and our devotions in self, in spiritual health, if you will. Okay. So many, and, and make, let's look at the application to Paul or to Timothy. Timothy's a preacher. There are many pastors today that quit and give up because they didn't take care of their own spiritual health. They're so busy taking care of everyone else's needs. They're so busy preparing messages to preach to other people that they neglect their own devotions. They neglect their own personal reading and their own personal Bible study time. And they don't feed their own spiritual soul. And they burn out because they're dealing with all the... And that's what Timothy was dealing with, with all these issues at the church at Ephesus. And he was getting burned out. And so Paul tells Timothy, listen, you've got to take care of you first. Because if you burn out, there's nobody to do the job. OK, you know, we as parents or just as people in general, OK, it's important that we take care of our own spiritual health. You know, you, you, you probably get tired of me hearing me saying it, but I always are constantly encouraging people to have your daily devotions. You know, we have the devotional books that are back there. You know, those are a couple of tools that you can use for your own devotions. Uh, there's many things that are online that we can do on a computer, things that we have on our phone, okay? All that sort of a thing. And so there's so many ways. We, basically what I'm saying, we don't have an excuse, really, to not have our devotions. It's all around us. We are, we are saturated with the Word of God and with tools to read and study and to know the truths of God's Word. The only reason we don't have our devotions is because of our own laziness, our own lack of commitment to this. And when we do, though, that's when we fail. You've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again and again and again and again. But if the only spiritual nourishment you get is on Sunday mornings from my messages, whereas as great as they may be, okay, it's not enough. We need to be fed on a daily basis. And if you're like me, food-wise, even on a daily basis, it's not enough. Amen? And my wife always makes fun of me. She makes a nice dinner. We sit and eat, and two hours later, I'm getting a snack. You know, it's like, I like to eat. You know, and spiritually, we should have that same craving, that same desire to do that, okay, to feed our own souls. Four things I want us to consider today, okay, when it comes to, to taking care of our own spiritual health. Four things I want us to consider to help us to be strong spiritually 
so that we can be so that we can continue on our devotion not just our devotions but our devotion to ourselves to God to people how do we do that four things i want us to consider okay the first one is that we need to consider rest and this just this is just my own personal thought okay it's not really anything that i drew from this text but as i was studying this and i was preparing this message and we're talking about self one of the biggest needs we have for spiritually is, to, is that, that rest that we need. And I don't mean rest like let's lay down on the, the sofa here and take a nap, okay? For if you're like me, you sit down and two minutes later you're falling asleep, amen? That's not what I'm talking about. But I just mean rest from all the... There is so much that draws our attention today. Think about it. We have our televisions running with the news and all the stuff that's going on there. And then social media, you know that I'm not a big social media buff. You know, I think too much stuff happens there. You just see drama and, and, and I, I'm not one that goes to Facebook every day. And it seems like when I do go, it's like this one's complaining about this and this one's complaining about that. And it's just, it's sad to see that. And you see the young people. And, and so there are so many things that draw our attention, so many things that we see and hear, okay? So much stuff, and it, it's, it's emotionally and spiritually draining that we need to rest. There's three verses, and I don't, they're kind of long. Hopefully you can see them up there. The words are kind of small. <clears throat> but um, when Jesus first started his ministry, of course, he's going around. He's got his disciples with him. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's healing. And so everywhere he went, people were flocking to him. Okay, and so as soon as he would come into a town or a city, wherever he would go, people had heard about his fame. And so they come rushing into him to see him, to, to be healed, to hear him preach and teach. And there came a time in, in Mark chapter six there where Jesus said to his disciples, he says, listen, guys, he says, come yourselves apart into a desert place. And what does he say? And rest a while. For there were, there were so many coming and going that Jesus and his disciples, they had no leisure so much as to sit down and eat. And so even Jesus is sharing with his disciples, it's important for us to come apart into that desert place, that quiet place, and just rest for a while. Turn off the noise. Turn off the TV. Turn off the radio. Turn off the computer. Turn off your phone. Everybody's like, what? Turn off my phone? Turn it off. Put off all the noise and the distraction. Get yourself a nice cup of coffee. And just sit down and relax and meditate upon the Lord. Come apart and rest. That's what he says. Jesus says we need to come apart and rest for just a little while. In Hebrews, the Bible says there remains therefore a rest unto the people of God. My friends, God wants us to have that rest. But so, so many of us miss out on it. That rest is in Jesus. That rest is coming and sitting at the feet of Jesus. Picture the story of Mary and Martha, if you will. When Jesus came to the house, where was Martha? She was cumbered about much serving in the kitchen, clanging and banging the pans. Where was Mary? She was resting at the feet of Jesus. My friends, we need Martha moments, but we also need Mary moments where we come apart and rest. That's what Jesus is saying. And then in Matthew 11, Jesus says this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The point that I think Jesus is trying to make, okay, if we're gonna, if we're gonna continue in our devotion, if we're gonna take care of ourselves, it's important for us to rest in Jesus. Come and sit at the feet of Jesus. How blessed that is. Just this morning, I was all ready for church and everything. And so I just sat down and, and I don't know why, but I've been kind of stuck on the Lord's Prayer. And so I, I outlined it this morning and it turned out pretty good, I must say. It was all the letter P's and stuff. And you're going to get that eventually, okay? But it was kind of nice to just sit there and look. And you know, as, as I think I said this last week, but in the Lord's Prayer, that, that prayer that Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, you realize that God brings everything to that. He brings it all. The only thing we bring to God in prayer is our own sin. That's it. That's all we bring to him. And yet for most of us, our prayers are, Lord, I need, Lord, I want, give me, you know, and, and that's not what praying is supposed to be. Okay. And so anyway, number one, I want you to consider rest. I know we're busy. I know we all got things to do. We all do. All right. But it's important for our own spiritual health. If we are to continue in our devotion, that we consider resting in Jesus and not just once in a while. I mean, this is something we should do on a daily basis. It really is. That's what our own personal devotion is. We do need to consider ourselves. Number two, you need to consider you. 
All right, I, I'm encouraging you to right now, right here, to be selfish, okay? Consider yourself. Now, again, understand Paul's telling, talking to Timothy, and Timothy's a young preacher, and, and preachers have a responsibility to their flock and to, to meet the needs of others. And all of us have people that count on us, whether it's our family or coworkers or stuff like that. And so there's always people that need us. I get that. But we do need to consider ourselves. We cannot allow ourselves to go. Some things I want us to consider about ourselves. And first and foremost, he tells Titus, he says, in all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. We must, if you imagine what this world would be like if everybody just did the right thing. I, I, I sit and think about that so much of the time. You know, it's just like people always just want to do the wrong thing, you know, or the easy thing instead of doing the right thing. But that's what Paul tells us as Christians. Number one thing we can do, the best thing that we can do for our spiritual house and our spiritual devotion is just do the right thing. We know what's right. I don't have to sit here and tell you what's right and wrong, okay? At least I shouldn't have to, especially if we've been Christian for a long time. We know what's right, so just do it. Do the right thing. That pattern of good works. Not just every once in a while, but a pattern of good works. We should be such goody two-shoes that people's like, what's wrong with you? You know, it really should be that way. And so that's one thing that we need to consider for ourselves is just doing the right things. He tells Timothy, again, he says to study to show thyself approved. That means getting into the truths of God's word, studying, reading, and learning, all right? And so filling yourself up, kind of like, you know, as we give out to people, as we're constantly giving and doing, we need to be refilling, recharging ourselves by reading and studying and praising and Christian music and stuff. And, and right now I'm, I'm reading a book. It's, a, it's what they call Christian fiction. Basically, it's by um, Angela Hunt. And, uh, but anyway, I can't, it, The Shepherd's Wife, I think, is what it's called. But basically, it, they take obscure people in the Bible and then they expound upon it, you know? And, and, and the person right now is, is one of Jesus' sisters. You say, well, well, you don't know anything about it. Well, that's what makes it nice for a book. You can make all this stuff up. But what I like about it is it teaches you a little bit of the history and culture and stuff. And it, it puts it into context, okay? And so, you know, whatever you got to do, but fill yourself back up. And so there's a lot of avenues that we have. Sure, we read and study the Word of God, but also good godly Christian music as well. And then Christian literature, things like that. Things that we could do to study, to show our people, to get together, that sort of a thing. And then also, lastly, considering ourselves, consider thyself lest all, thou also be tempted. We need to understand that everywhere we go, the devil's always out to get us. Amen. He truly is. He wants to rob you of your joy. That's his purpose in life. God, excuse me, the devil cannot take your salvation. You're saved. You know you're saved. That belongs to you. You're sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Satan knows that he cannot take away your salvation. He knows that. But what he can do is take away the joy of your salvation. Constantly tempting us. Constantly pulling us away with, with evil thoughts. With not good thoughts. You know, things like worry and fear and doubt and anger. You, you name it. You know, and, and the devil, he's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. But he does know how to push our buttons. He truly does. He knows how to do those things that, that aggravate us to no end. And so, you know, we need to consider ourselves that that temptation is always there. The Bible says, take heed, you know, that we don't let pride get in the way lest we fall. And that's usually what happens when we think we're doing great. And this, the devil just kind of knocks the stool out from under ourselves. So we do need to consider ourselves. Think about you of filling yourself up and be aware of the devil that's out there. Okay. <clears throat> Look in verse 13. Well, this is our next one. Considering the doctrine. Now, doctrine's mentioned a couple times in this passage of Scripture. So doctrine is important. So what is it? Well, let's look at this. He says in verse 13, Paul told Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Let's take a look at this doctrine. What is this thing? First of all, he says, give attendance to reading. Now, you and I, when we read the Bible, we read it at home in the, the comfort of our own home, right? Isn't that how we do it? That's what reading is all about. We sit down, we read the Bible, and we it, it's personal between us, you and I. But that's not how it was done when Paul wrote these words. Because when Paul wrote these words, nobody had a Bible, okay? The only copy of scriptures were the scrolls, which was the first five books of the Bible, basically, the Pentateuch. And those scrolls were where? They were at the temple. And so when he says, give, you know, um, give attendance to reading, this wasn't just reading. This was public reading. 
And so they would go to the temple and the, 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 the priest would get the scrolls out of the menorah closet and they would roll them out and they would read and it would be read out loud publicly. It was a very public thing. And my friends, we need that today. If we're going to know doctrine, if we're going to know truth, we need that sharing. I'm thankful for a godly wife, you know, that I can share scripture with her and she can share scripture with me. And we can talk about these things. That's important that we have that, okay? Uh, that's why you see in churches they have ladies' Bible studies and men's fellowships where they study the scriptures together. This is a very public thing, this reading of scripture. That's how that we make sure. The Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. A lot of times when we get off on ourselves, we could get ourselves messed up with some wrong thinking. I know a lot of fellers that have done that, you know, and they get off on a tangent on something and it, they never had anybody to bring them back. But doctrine is important, but there's that, it's that public aspect of it. That pu personal reading is important. Don't get me wrong. We need to have that. And when we come to church, certainly when he talks about, you know, giving attendance to public reading, that's what we did today. We read the scriptures publicly and it's being preached and taught to us, okay? But it's important that we have more than that. If we're going to know the truths of God's word, of God's doctrine, we really don't have any excuse to say, I don't know what the Bible means because there are some, ask somebody. Why are we afraid to ask somebody? I've never understood that. You know, if I have a question of scripture, you know, I've got preacher friends that call them up and I'm like, hey, you know, what, what do you, how do you read this? How do you interpret this? You know, there's nothing wrong with asking that question. There's nothing wrong with coming to pastor and say, pastor, can you help me understand this? We should do that. So number one, when he says give, or, you give attendance to reading, yeah, reading the word of God, but that public reading, that public sharing. Secondly, he says, give attendance to exhortation. That word to exhort actually means a calling to one side. And when I look at that definition, I don't know about you, but in my mind, what I see is a mom, you know, pulling her daughter into her lap and comforting her when she's going through a rough time. That's what exhortation is. We need that today. We need that personal element in our devotion if we are going to be healthy in that devotion, where we, we're there one for another. Everybody needs somebody. They truly do. No person is an island under themselves. Nobody. We need somebody that's always going to have our back. Somebody that's always going to be there for us. And that doesn't mean that we coddle them. If, if they're wrong, we're going to tell them they're wrong. You know, and if they won't listen, we'll smack them upside the head. We do. That's part of exhortation. But it's that in, intimacy, that closeness that we have. And again, very thankful for a godly wife that I have that we can share those things together. But that's part of what our doctrine is all about, is where we share things personally on an up-close level okay and let me just say this here too be very careful you know i've seen people that have done this i know people personally that have done this and it's not right but when it comes to being personal like this getting that closeness closeness and an in intimacy i can't speak that closeness and intimacy it should always be a lady with another lady a guy with another guy or a husband and wife no other combination I have no preachers that got too close with another lady, secretary, somebody ruined their marriage. It's not a good thing, you know? And so it's never a good thing to do that. And so let me just throw that out there. But we do need that, in, in, I can't say that word today, <laughs> intimacy, all right? And I'm thankful that I have it with my wife. And as I said, there are preachers that I know that I can call, we can share those things with. And that's important that we have that. And then lastly is the doctrine. That doctrine, the literal word doctrine, all it means is that which is taught. Those things which have been taught. That's what doctrine is about. And we're supposed to consider those things that have been taught. You know, as you sit here today and you listen to me preach, if you're a Christian, you've been a Christian any length of time, most of this stuff you've probably heard already. Okay, and it's good though that we're reminded of those things. I want you to consider this, okay? How, how many years did Jesus spend with his disciples? About three years, okay? And so three, three and a half years, Jesus walked with his disciples and he taught them. That's what the doctrine was. That's that apostle's doctrine. And he taught them. And so basically, Jesus taught them everything they needed to know in three years, all right? Anything beyond that was just reminding Reminding, 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 reinforcing, and maybe going just a little bit deeper. The Apostle Paul, who wasn't with Jesus and the disciples at the time, okay, he went to the Arabian Desert, and you know, and, and while he was there, God taught Paul 
on his own. We don't know much about what happened then. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we know what happened. And so God taught Paul in the Arabian desert. Do you know how long Paul was in the Arabian desert all by his lonesome being taught by God? Three years. And so, you know, it, 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 it's, you know how, that's how long I was in Bible college. Three years. It's about all it takes, you know, to learn the truths of God's word. But I got to tell you something. After my three years of Bible college, sure, I had that basic Bible doctrine down pat. But at, over the last 30 years, God has constantly reaffirmed and retaught and reminded me and helped me to go a little bit deeper and to root these things down deep into my soul. And I'm thankful for it so that when I read the word of God, I'm like, oh, yeah. That's wonderful. That's awesome. That's amazing. Uh, this morning, I kind of had a little moment looking up verses about the kingdom of God because I was doing God, the, the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. And, and I was just having a moment there, you know, just, whoo, praise the Lord, bring the kingdom on. I'm ready, you know, and stuff. But my friends today, consider doctrine. It is important, okay? There is right, there is wrong. And we must follow the truths of God's word if we are to continue in our devotion. And then lastly, one last thing, and we're not going too long here today. The Holy Spirit is a big part of this, okay? That is a gift that God has given to you and I today. When we get saved, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. It truly does, okay? Um, and that's not always been the case. In the Old Testament, God would give his spirit to men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and people like that, even people like Samuel, who was a priest and the spiritual leader, God would give them his spirit to lead the people. But in general, people didn't have the power of the spirit of God upon them. And even when Jesus first came and was preaching and teaching and stuff, you've got to understand is that when Jesus went to the cross, I mean, I don't know how many people were in the world at the time, but it was a lot. Not like today where there's billions, but it was a lot. But when Jesus died on the cross and all these people that were there and everybody that had heard him preached and teached and all these things like that and stuff. But when he died, out of all the, I don't know, again, hundreds of thousands of people. I don't know if there was millions yet at that time. But of all those people, do you know how many people were followers when he died? About 120. I see it. That's all there was. And it's because there wasn't the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But 50 days after, 50 days after this happened, what happened? It's the day of Pentecost, okay? And we could get into that, into the doctrine of that. You know, in, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, Pentecost was that feast that took place 50 days after the slaughter of the Lamb. And so on the day of Pentecost, though, on that day, the Bible says that Peter stood up before the crowds there in Jerusalem, and there was a great massive crowd of people there, and the Spirit of God came upon Peter. And Peter began to speak in what we call tongues. Now, it wasn't some foreign language jibber-jabber, but he was speaking the language of every person that was there. And the way I explain it, the way I think to look at this is if you've ever watched a newscast of, of a UN meeting, okay, you got a speaker that stands up and speaks. Let's say he's speaking in English, but you have people from all these countries there, okay? So how do they understand what this guy's saying here? If I'm speaking in English and everyone else has got their own language, I'll tell you how. Because if you look, each one of them's got a wire in their ear. And somebody is taking what the preacher is, or what, not the preacher, but what the person is speaking and interpreting it so that they hear it in their own language. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up. He didn't have a microphone. And he didn't have interpreters. The interpreter was the Holy Spirit of God. So Peter stood up and he preached the gospel. God loves you. Jesus Christ died for you. You need to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus as your Savior. And every person that was there heard Peter in their own language. That's what tongues was all about. And so that each person can then go back to their own nation, their own land, and tell others about this Jesus in their language. That was the purpose of the, the, the speaking in tongues. But that's what that Holy Spirit did. And then, after that though, anybody who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior is now, the Bible says, we are filled with the Spirit of God. The Bible says, you what? No, you not. You are the temple of the Spirit of God. That Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. That day that you got saved, that day you prayed and asked Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit came upon you. And the Bible says that Spirit seals you until the day of redemption, until we hear the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel. And God's going to call us up together to be with Him, to be in the kingdom. <laughs> that day my friends today listen to me that spirit is there don't neglect that gift that's what paul told timothy don't neglect the gift that is in you that gift that's in you is the power of the holy spirit of god 
You know, some people might want to say, well, that's my conscience. Eh, okay. It's not some little Jiminy Cricket in there, okay? It's the power of the Holy Spirit of God that's inside of you today, guiding you, directing you in what is truth. Galatians 6 says this, He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he, and this is where the Spirit comes in, he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't want to become weary and quit in our devotion, if we want to continue in our devotion, we need to feed the Spirit of God inside of us. Don't be afraid of the power of the Spirit of God. Listen to that Spirit. And we do that by all the things that I've been talking about. By reading the Word of God, by being having that closeness, that fellowship, by, by listening to the Word of God preached, by having that person, that close person with you. All these things that we've talked about feed the Spirit of God, which in turn feeds us and helps us to continue in our devotion. My friends, we are spiritual beings, whether we understand that or not. We are spiritual beings. The Bible says we are spiritually made, and we need to feed the Spirit of God in our life if we are to continue in our devotion. I am not a prophet, so I have no idea what the future holds, none whatsoever, okay? Things could get way worse, okay? They, they truly could. Or we could see a mighty revival. You know, God's not told me one way or the other. I still pray for revival. I pray that we would see churches filled again and packed, you know, and people getting right with the Lord and stuff like that. Uh, this whole Roe versus Wade thing, that was, whew, that was pretty big. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Didn't think I'd see that in my lifetime, but yay, you know. And so I was pretty glad about that. So I have no idea. All I know is that I know him. And I know that my life is in his hands. I ain't got nothing to worry about, okay? And so, my friends, today I encourage each and every one of us to continue in your devotion to the Lord. Do those things. Four things to consider. Consider rest. Consider yourself. Consider the doctrine. Consider the Holy Spirit. Those four things, I think, will help us in our devotion to ourselves and to God and to this world, okay?